First of all, can you talk a little bit about when you finally got word from El Paso uh, that the DNA, um, in this case, matched uh, your case here in Fort Worth? I believe we received notification from El Paso Police Department in, uh, I think it was June, and, and that's when we uh, revisited the investigation and went to El Paso to, to talk to those detectives. Can you tell me your reaction? Oh, uh, very excited. Very excited. This was this case, uh, extremely brutal case. Uh, it, was, it was a horrible incident for the victim, and we were uh, at a point where we we had exhausted a lot of our investigative leads. So to get the CODIS hit or the DNA results was very exciting, and uh, we were anxious to cooperate with El Paso PD. You can't talk much about the case here in Fort Worth, but when you start looking at the rapes, the alleged rapes in El Paso, similar. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. There are some ways. letters. Um, with, with regards to the cases in El Paso, uh, they, they seem to have evidence that shows that the, the suspect was, was uh, watching his victims prior to the assaults. Uh, they have uh, evidence that indicates that he was burglarizing the homes prior to the assaults uh, and revisiting them. Uh, and there are some similar similarities to the case that we have here that, that would indicate that uh, he, he had uh, maintained that MO, if you will, when he went to El Paso. Does this, um, do these cases give you an indication that he might have done this even before your case in Fort Worth? At this point, we, we, we don't know. We, we don't have any definite information linking him to other cases, but because of the information that we were able to gather from the incidents in El Paso, we have, we have started to try to work with other detectives in the Metroplex area uh, and see if we can link other cases together. Uh, so it's, we, we've started that process. What makes... Uh, what really alarmed you? Of course, it's a brutal crime, it's a rape, but what alarmed you most about this suspect? This particular suspect, uh, again, like you said, very, very brutal. Very brutal to the victim. Um, it was a horrible incident. Uh, the victim had uh, done nothing to uh, uh, invite the situation. She didn't even put herself in a position of being a victim. She was in her own home. So. Uh, for us, that's uh, extremely alarming. There, there was nothing to indicate that this was going to happen. In, in El Paso, um, how are you all helping El Paso with their investigation? At this point, uh, we, we really uh, are not communicating with El Paso because I think they've already filed their cases. But prior to, we, we basically had a, a brainstorm. Uh, uh, got into a, a conference room with them and, and discussed their cases, discussed the similarities with our case and uh, tried to help them link everything together in that way. In the Fort Worth case, what did you really have? I mean, you said that you exhausted all, pretty much all your resources trying to find or identify this individual, but you only had, well, you didn't have much. We didn't. We had a, a, br a very, very vague brief description from the victim because, because of the, the, the brutality involved. She wasn't able to provide us with much of a description. Uh, we had evidence that was collected on scene that was later processed to assist, uh, but um, more than that, we, well, by, when I say we, we exhausted all leads, a, a normal uh, investigation is going to involve dealing with all the sexual uh, offenders in that area that are registered, uh, seeing if anyone in the area matches the, the description that we do have, uh, talking to witnesses, a lot of footwork as, as they call it. So. And so when you had the DNA, and I don't know as a detective, when you say, okay, we have biological evidence, is it kind of you just at the mercy of waiting for another crime or waiting for, you know, for the person to strike again? Uh, there may come a point in the investigations where you do get to that point. You're at the mercy of waiting on those results. Uh, in this one, uh, we, we weren't to that point yet. We were still trying to talk to folks in the neighborhood. We were still try trying to identify anybody that could help. Uh, so we hadn't reached that point, but there are some cases where you do get to that point. And so when you hear that all of a sudden he's being connected to at least three in El Paso, um, as a detective, you know, you believe you have your, your guy, um, but is there a part of you that's, wow, it took another three incidents to finally catch him. There is a certain level of frustration because you, as part of being a, an officer or a detective, you don't, you want to protect. Uh, uh, that's, that's what we sign up for. And, and to hear that there's the victims that were uh, uh, 
or people that fell victim to this person after the fact in Fort Worth is, is disheartening, but it's but it also led us to where we are. So we, we have a, a suspect in custody, uh, and because of the accumulation of evidence in El Paso and what we had here, uh, we, we've been able to file some cases with the state. So it's, it's, it is disheartening that other victims, other people had to fall victim, but it's also exciting that we have taken a, a hard predator off the streets. And as, as far as the victim, uh, you told us yesterday that um, she was emotional, um, and I'm sure for victims, just knowing that you don't have even a name, you don't really have a face, that the last year, um, living every day must have been yes. tough for her. Yes, ma'am. And, and one of the things that, that we encounter most often in the sexual assault unit is, is that a lot of times our victims will know who was involved, who, who their suspect is. So I, I can't even begin to imagine the, the, the terror and the fear that you have to live with if you have no idea who it was that you fell victim to um, and and yes she was emotional whenever that we were able to uh, to pass on the information that we we felt like we had the suspect and he was in custody and no longer a danger to her or anybody else uh, so yeah very exciting can you t can you share a little bit about um, what she told you when you finally gave her the news and then of course you have to do some investigative work after that just come in and, and you have to meet with her and and get your case finally to get it ready to file, but can you tell us just some of that emotion of what finally that... No, I really can't. Because the case is pending for indictment, I can't really talk to you about what she said because that is part of... it, it, it all lends to the investigation. Uh, I will tell you that she was very, very happy. Very, very happy to find out that she was safe. You haven't been on the unit for a long time. No, ma'am. So, I don't know, where does... is this case in your career, you know, from here on out, is it something... I mean. This is a pretty big case. Definitely a landmark case for me. Uh, and, and there were so many people involved that made this case happen. Uh, I, I get to sit here and talk to you and, and reap the benefits of that, but our crime scene unit did an outstanding job, and, and they were a critical component in identifying this suspect. Our lab, our DNA lab, the, the, the folks that work over there are amazing. And, uh, and of course, the, the veteran detectives that I get to work with, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a lot of great people in this department that made this happen. If you wouldn't have had that DNA, do you think you would have been able? That's that's the question. Uh, I'm going to tell you that in this case, uh, that biological evidence was critical. It, it is what helped us to find the suspect as quickly as we did. Uh, I never rule out good old-fashioned detective work and the fact that we would have found him at some point, but uh, the biological evidence was critical and, and capturing him as quickly as he got caught. Uh, El Paso was able to, to, to catch him um, but looking at his crimes, his alleged crimes in El Paso, um, they're already calling him a serial rapist, but the, do, you, uh, do you believe, uh, is there something in your gut that tells you there could be even more, or if we wouldn't have caught this person, I mean, it's, he would have kept on going? My opinion is that yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I believe that uh, he, he would have certainly kept going if he weren't caught, and maybe even escalated. Uh, that's the nature of, of, of predators like him. Uh, uh, but uh, part of the reason that, that I appreciate you doing this story is that my hope is that if there are victims that did not report because they were terrified of any kind of uh, retribution of reporting this to police, that they would come forward. Um, it's difficult not being able to release the details, but, but if there are any victims that, that, that fell, prey, fell prey to to someone like this, I would hope they would come forward so that we can uh, link these cases together. And it was a challenge because he's not he's not a legal resident. He's a That's not an immigrant. So you really didn't, you couldn't, you can only take it so far just because that probably made it more difficult to find. That's correct, yes ma'am. And, and that was one of the things that was so, uh, helpful when we dealt with uh, El Paso PD because they have more experience dealing with folks who are not uh, United States citizens. So uh, leaning on their experience when it came to that was really helpful. Is there, um, we're hearing from El Paso that they're, they're even looking at the possibility that there could have been some crimes over on the other side. Yes ma'am, yes ma'am. That's what I was told by them is that there are possible uh, cases that they have pending to investigate whenever we're through with it. Can you elaborate a little bit on that as far as uh, no, ma'am. I'm. They. They. That's basically what they told me. I don't even know what the allegations are on the other side of the border. Because that they've had 
issues on that side as well Correct, with, yes, with sex assaults and uh, against women. So that's I guess that's what the frightening situation because it I mean when you look at all of it it's just um, he was it looks like he was stalking in some way um, and I mean he was really doing from what you all believe his homework on his victims in the sense of what he could do. Based on the cases that we have been able to uh, to link him to, yes, ma'am, we believe so. We believe he was really doing his homework. Was he? Do you think it was like a matter of days, or it was just probably like a you know maybe a day before the attack, or? I, I don't know. I don't know how much time he spent uh, watching victims. Uh, I just based based on some of the the information that we were able to see, again, especially from El Paso, uh, it looks like. He spent some time watching his victims prior to making any kind of attack. In um, you know, so sometimes in in, 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 in in most cases, and it depends on the case, but that justice can be delayed. Um, just knowing that you can give that piece uh, to someone, there's still a lot of work that needs to go, that needs to go to court, and all of that. But just to give that um, to a woman. Um, in the, and especially the woman in this case, how does that make you feel? Me personally, uh, that is the reason why I joined this department, and, and, and that's the reason why I do what I do is to make uh, have the opportunity to do what I can to make people feel safe. Um, Fort Worth has become much safer, even just since I've been working here. Uh, not not because of me, but but in the last decade, the the, the city is is a much more enjoyable place to be. It's a lot more fun, and uh, for victims like the one in this case, it's, it's incredibly gratifying to be a part of a team that, that, that can help her, give her some solace and some, some, some feeling of safety. Okay.